you're listening to Unlimited Hangout. I'm your host, Whitney Webb. It should be clear to regular listeners of this podcast that we live in a time of extraordinary deceit, and that such deceit is regular and now normalized behavior on the part of both the private sector and the public sector. For those that spend a considerable amount of time analyzing how such deceit and accompanying uh, acts of corruption and criminal activity are so commonplace and rarely, if ever, investigated, it quickly becomes clear that the way we have been conditioned to believe the world works That is, the public sector oversees and regulates the private sector to prevent and prosecute illegal activity and so on is a deliberate fabrication. Critical questions that arise from this realization include the following. What is the role of the public sector today if our governments are in fact not setting policy and not fulfilling their purported roles? Who then is actually creating policy? Is it merely the private sector having overtaken the public through corporate capture Or are there other groups and structures who were driving the decision-making processes of both the private and public sectors behind closed doors? The examination of the bigger picture of who is actually creating and driving policy in the real power structures of our world today has been fraught with problems for years, as different commentators and analysts have often sought to point the finger at only this group or that group, obscuring the tapestry of different factions and institutions vying to be our overlords. However, the task is nonetheless an important one, and it wasn't until I stumbled upon the recent work of my guest today that I had seen what I consider to be the most rational and cohesive explanation for the current power structure that is not only responsible for our current situation, but also that which is driving us into the so-called fourth industrial revolution and more aptly named techno-fascism at full speed. Joining me to discuss his critical work, not just on his analysis of the powers that be, which he aptly names the Global Public-Private Partnership, but also his work on the multiple and multifaceted layers of deceit that have defined the COVID-19 crisis, is Ian Davis. Ian is a writer and researcher based in England who writes at his website, In This Together. He also contributes to the UK column in Off Guardian and is often featured on the Corbett Report, among other independent media outlets. And he is also the author of several books, the most recent of which is entitled Pseudo-Pandemic on the COVID-19 Crisis, which is currently available through his website. Thanks for joining me today, Ian. How are you doing? I'm fine, Whitney. Thank you very much for having me on. Absolutely. My pleasure. Well, um, I already mentioned in introducing you that your name for the powers that be, as some may call them, is the Global Public-Private Partnership, or the GPPP. (laughs) Uh, But before we get into that, I think it might be useful First, to define stakeholder capitalism, a term that we have all been hearing from the World Economic Forum Davos crowd more and more over the past few years, uh, partly because the way you define the GPPP uh, relies on people knowing exactly more or less what that term means, and not everybody does. So, Ian, how do you define stakeholder capitalism? Stakeholder capitalism, as it's presented to us, is essentially a deception. So the 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 idea of stakeholder capitalism is more is a more responsible model of capitalism that people would be, um, you know, the global corporations, NGOs, uh, philanthropic organizations all come together to to form a new model of, of capitalism, which takes into account the problems of our times. So. It's initially it's presented to us, and this goes back to the 1970s when um, Klaus Schwab first started from the World Economic Forum, first started talking about stakeholder capitalism, that it was a way it was presented to us as a way for um, what we might call global capitalists to take a more responsible role in the stewardship of the of the planet. Um, you know, and obviously, at the you know, when we're talking about the environmental problems that we face and so forth, that they that they were suggesting that that they recognise their role in contributing to the problems that we that we face, and that they were um, ready and willing to take an active part in doing something about that, which on the face of it sounds you know reasonable and perhaps something that most people would applaud. Unfortunately, that is not what stakeholder capitalism is actually about. Stakeholder capitalism is a way for stakeholder partners, which are those partners that I just mentioned there. So we're talking not just um, global corporations, but also government, also um, philanthropic organisations, 
um, NGOs, uh, global charities, civil society is something that come, very much comes into it. These stakeholders will take an active role in essentially forming the regulation of their own markets. So they will take a more of a, of a, a political role in forming the regulation of markets. So partners within the stakeholder capitalist network include governments. So we often hear governments say that they are working with their industry partners. That is a, a literal, we should translate that literally. They are working with people, with, with global corporations, with NGOs, with philanthropic organisations on an equal partnership basis. Which, of course, if you are a corporation, having control over the regulation of your own market is a very enticing prospect. And that is essentially what that's what stakeholder capitalism really means, rather than the image of stakeholder capitalism. I'm really glad you made a distinction between how they sell what they sell stakeholder capitalism is and what it actually is. Um, because I think that's a uh, really Im important, really important point there. Um, what's interesting, uh, to me personally is that some of these stakeholders that they, that they, uh, propose to include, include, uh, NGOs that are essentially backed by, uh, quote unquote philanthropists who themselves are the heads of the multinational corporations. And then you have, you know, the, the, the public sector, uh, the, the governments, right? So it's really, uh, ultimately just comes down to, uh, you know, sort of as you say it, a, a public private partnership. Um, but, um, in, in, in talking and sort of fleshing out, um, your, um, definition, um, of, uh, this global partnership, um, in a recent article that you published on your website that was republished by some outlets like Off Guardian, uh, you include a graphic that I would encourage people uh, listening who are interested to go ahead and, and look up because it sort of lays out um, the hierarchy um, of this partnership. Um, so um, why don't you start, I guess, maybe by explaining your, your theory here, I guess, um, uh, about how uh, this system is is sort of set up uh, and, uh, you know, who you put at the top and why and and so on. Yeah, so um, I've looked at um, basically how policy flows around the planet. So how, how where does policy originate? Who distributes that policy? How is it enforced? How is it sold to us? And, and what is the impact of that policy upon us? Now, uh, most people, I think, see the world in what we might consider to be a, a, in terms of a Westphalian model of national sovereignty. And that, and to a great extent, that's, that's, that's still true. I mean, countries can't, one country can't make laws in another country. That is true. And national sovereignty still exists. However, when we look at things, uh, at the world governance level, and I would draw a distinction between governance and government, um, we can see that there is a centralized for many policies, which are, are, are policies that we that we are familiar with, um, there is a centralized global hub which formulates those policies in terms of policy agendas. Um, so the question is, who is forming these policy agendas? So, uh, you know, I think a good example of, of a policy of policy agenda is sustainable development. So sustainable development goals have have impacted us right down to the local level. There it doesn't pretty much anywhere you live on Earth. If you go to a, a search engine of your choice and put in the local area where you live and follow that with sustainable development plan or something similar, you'll be able to find your local sustainable development plan or, or you know, in, in similar words. So this policy impacts everywhere on the planet at once. But it but so how does that happen? How does how is it possible that everywhere on Earth could be, you know, have have this very, very similar policies, no matter where you live? Where do they come from? Well, 
there is a historical uh, precedent for global public private partnerships or GPPPs, which is a, perhaps a bit of a mouthful. Uh, it historically comes from um, global health policy. So it was um, it was that documents such as in 2005, the uh, Connecting for Health, um, where the World Health Organization spoke about um, a changing world of revised expectations. So in, in 2005, uh, the World Health Organization were saying that governments would no longer lead on policy. And in fact, within the GPPP, they don't lead on policy. They they are partners in the policy. I mean, it's, it's arguable that they're not even creating policy, that what they're actually doing is they're part of the policy distribution and enforcement network rather than forming it themselves. But in that document, um, the, the World Health Organization said that governments can create an enabling environment and invest in equity, access and innovation. So government has ceased to be leading on the policy, but is rather through taxation um, and debt, you, uh, we, we could say as well, um, is, is basically creating the markets for the stakeholder capitalists, because because the two, uh, the, both concepts of the global public private partnership and stakeholder capitalism are intertwined. Mm -hmm. So, so if we look at the global public private partnership itself, the first thing we think is, well, who's making policy? Mm -hmm. Well, we need to look at the the kind of global think tanks. And, you know, people like the World Economic Forum, arguably, they have been a policy conduit and and originate. I mean, you know, we would talk about the Great Reset. That is a that is a set of policy agendas, basically. Um, and and from that, we get governments talking about build back better which uh, that goes back to the United Nations. So, I mean, you've, you've got these global authorities that, that develop ideas and kick around global agendas. And uh, at the top of that, you, and fundamentally, it's an, we're looking at economic control of a global economic control. So, you know, if we think about at the top of the, of the hierarchy, we might have the Bank of International Settlements. So the, the Bank of International Settlements, which are the central bank for central banks, who, you know, have got a rather murky past. Um, you know, certainly there was uh, they were accused of um, laundering Nazi Nazi money and gold money, um, you know. So, but anyway, the, the Bank of International Settlements are, are, are extremely powerful global financial institution. Um, and, you know, th then perhaps the, around them, obviously, we've got the national central banks. Now, there is some debate about how money is created. Um, but for now, and unless we're going to go into that in incredible depth, and I, I would I would um, advocate that people read a paper by Dr. Richard Verner, um, and I will, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, the name of that paper, um, but he basically proves that money is created out of thin air, and he calls it fairy dust. Um, and I <laughs> well, and, like that name for it. <laughs> yeah, fairy dust. Uh, but I mean, I, I mean, but genuinely, he empirically proves it. I and mean, there's been a lot of debate about the source of money and how money is created. But um, he does empirically prove how it is created. So I think that paper by Dr. Richard Werner is well worth reading. Um, so let's say that the, the top of this financial system, we've got the Bank of International Settlements, followed by the central banks, who control global flows of capital. So I think it's important when we're perhaps trying to introduce this to people um, to, to stress that, that there is a centralised authority, perhaps we could call it, who control the global flow of money. So that is a power, which, of course, <laughs> you know, I mean, that that 
I think I think pe most people don't realise that that the, 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 that there is anybody or any group of people who are capable of doing that, but there are, <laughs> and they really do control all money. So if you've got that power, that you know that gives you ability to certainly to be able to steer policy. And then we've and then we've got you know what we might call the the, the global think tank. So organisations like Chatham House, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, um, Council on Foreign Relations, these kind of people, Club of Rome, people like that, who develop policy agenda. And, I, and collectively, we might call this group the policy makers, people who, I mean, we could look at sustainable development and how that has come from, um, you know, in the in the 1970s and 1990s, the Club of Rome. So when I was talking about the global public private partnership, you've got these people at the head of that that are a centralised authority on a global level who can make policy agendas. So then that gets bounced around inside the think tanks and the think tanks end up that ends up going to what we might call the policy distributors. So the people who distribute distribute governance. So they're not distributing governance. They're not creating law. They're not making legislation, but they are having an impact on law and legislation at the national level. So. And and introducing policies at the national level in exchange, for example, um, you know, relief, relief money, aid money, as such, such as the IMF. So the IMF, the IMF will, um, you know, they'll, they'll have a um, an agreement for, for financing in exchange for a set of policy commitments. Mm -hmm. So so they're not. I mean, I think it's debatable. And one thing I would say about this this network that I've kind of drawn out in the in in the article and in the book is it's fluid. You know, I mean, I think I think it's debatable about you know to what degree do the IMF actually make make policy or contribute to the development of that policy? You know, so so it's uh, but it is it is the centralised source of policy that then, that then cascades down through national government to us. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's a I think it's very apt to say, for example, that the IMF, you know, gets its policy from from a lot of these think tanks that you laid out that it then, you know, uses its uh, role as this global financial institution to then uh, essentially, uh, you know, uh, carrot and stick national governments into complying or implementing uh, those policies, sort of a bridge from the policy makers to um, policy enforcers, as you label the uh, the national governments in this in this system. But I do think, as you sort of alluded to a second ago, there is a, a, a certain degree of um, I don't really know <laughs> what to call it, maybe cross pollination uh, between these. Yeah. So, for example, you know the the World Economic Forum, their board of trustees includes. Um, central bankers, uh, a, you know, sort of a, above them in this in this hierarchy, um, but also the head of the IMF, for example, um, and then um, you know uh, some of these uh, ostensibly private institutions that, in the case of the U.S. central bank, the Federal Reserve, uh, tend to have uh, a considerable amount of control and influence, like BlackRock, for example, which I believe is essentially the world's biggest investor. Um, you know. They, they yeah. sort of, uh, have a fluid position in this, uh, as well. But more or less, it's, it, I, I, I really feel like it's, a, you know, essentially what you laid out. And I, I do want to stress too that, you know, there are a lot of these global think tanks. The World Economic Forum, of course, has been uh, at the forefront of what's been going on recently and the Great Reset and all of that. What they used to call, um, as you note in your article, the global redesign process. <laughs> which is a much more yeah. Uh, yeah. telling name. I think they realized they had to make it a little less um, obvi <laughs> obvious, <laughs> maybe um, give it a, a slightly shorter, snappier name, perhaps. Um, but they're, you know, so, so uh, they've been sort of at the forefront and they basically produce policy for every area of society where some um, other think tanks in this, in this zone, I guess, um, like the CFR, for example, tend to focus more on what, like foreign policy, um, and things like that. So some are sort of more specialized, some are more, mm -hmm. uh, broad. Um, one I would add maybe would be like the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the U.S. Yeah. Um, but there's yeah. a lot of these groups, 
too many of them, one could argue, but they also partner up between them. Um, you know, like the Weff and Carnegie partnered up to, uh, uh, produce some, some of these papers about ending financial anonymity and online anonymity, um, and things like that. And you also place, uh, the Rockefellers up there who are another, uh, <laughs> quite fluid group, uh, in, in terms of their, uh, longstanding Wall Street ties, uh, and ties to these, uh, policy setting bodies. Uh, or, or creating bodies like the Club of Rome and some of the CFR Trilateral Commission and some of these groups as well. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, I think the hierarchy you lay out from policymaker, policy distributor to policy enforcer, and then to us, the policy subjects, the subjects um, is, is, is honestly very apt and a very uh, useful hierarchy for sort of explaining how this works to uh, people that, um, you know, haven't really, uh, thought about this that much because, you know, with the World Economic Forum being so out in front and center, a lot of people in the past, I don't know, year and a half that maybe, um, weren't investigating or looking into the space very much before may be inclined to think, well, it certainly looks like Klaus Schwab is running things. And, eh, I mean, you could sort of argue that, but it's definitely a much, uh, more complex, uh, situation than just, uh, the World Economic Forum is driving all of this in and of themselves, um, you know. Yeah, I think I think the important thing is 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 people tend to want to identify a, an enemy or a bogeyman or a you know a, some kind of uh, Svengali that they can say, oh yeah, this, this person's the, they're the ones that are doing it, you know. And then this is in, the, in as you said, it's far more complex than that. And this is a, a global network of of shared interests, right? So, I mean, one of the things that, that people often say is, well, how could you possibly keep all these people in line and, and how could you, you know, how could that possibly operate? Well, obviously, if you, for a start, if you control the flow of finance, that's a fairly big stick to be able to, to uh, hold people together because even multinational corporations need access to finance. So, you know that's that's ob- the obvious way that it could be done, but but also I think that it's important that these these people are working together collectively for a, a shared broad set of goals. It doesn't mean that they all agree with each other and they all want to do the same thing at the same time. And they, are, you know, I think this idea of a and one of the things that I've tried to stress in the book is this is. It is an extremely powerful organization and network which is shaping global policy, but it's formed of people who are fallible and who have their own agendas and, you know, they can fall out with each other and argue about, you know, so it's, it's not, um, it's, it's not an insurmountable enemy to face. And, and I think that's one of the, when we talk about this kind of information, it can very quickly kind of descend into feeling hopeless because you kind of think, well, how can anybody, how can we ever possibly challenge something like this? But the point is, it is, it is a group of people who are just like the rest of us. So if we understand who they are and what they are doing and how they are doing it, then we can challenge it. But we need to be realistic about who these people are and and how, and that was very much my intention in the book, was to try and show this network and say exactly that, 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 that these, aren't, these aren't infallible demigods. You know, they're, they're just a bunch of, of very, very powerful and influential people who have got their own agenda. And, and and are working collectively to achieve it. But they're a small number, and we are, by comparison, a vast number. Right. And but though, of course, what these guys are quite uh, adept at doing um, is divide and conquering uh, us, the policy subjects, <laughs> um, exactly. and, and keeping us sort of siloed. Uh, from each other, but it's worth noting that those same, uh, not the same divisions, but there are also a lot of divisions as, as, as you alluded to a second ago, um, within this sort of elite, uh, structure. There's different factions, different interest groups, and, you know, more often than not, they have shared interests, but sometimes, uh, they are competing interests in certain facets of these, um, larger plans or, uh, emerging markets and, and different things. They don't always have, 
uh, they don't always see eye to eye and then tend to have, uh, you know, uh, they, they fall out with each other as, as you mentioned. And I think, you know, as, as, um, their efforts, uh, advance, uh, I think those rifts will become more apparent because a lot of these people, uh, given the, the crazy sociopaths that they are, um, well, you know, the more control they obtain, the more, uh, fighting over the spoils they may engage in. Um, so that's uh, a hope that, um, I have because, you know, once the divisions among them are, you know, um, more apparent, that can, uh, be used to hopefully the advantage of the, of the public, or at least in the sense of, uh, allowing the, uh, certain groups of the public to see, um, more of, of the big picture of what's, uh, been going on, not just, uh, in the past year and a half, but especially in the past year and a half, um, among, yeah. among other things. So, um, Really quick, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, you make a point to differentiate between global government and global governance. And I think this is a really important distinction, uh, because, you know, some people may have be familiar with, you know, the, the, the rantings and ravings of, of Alex Jones, for example, um, who has been talking about, oh, they're going to install a global govern, government, uh, that you, um, have a, have an interesting way of approaching this subject because essentially what you posit with the global public private partnership is that it's really a system that we already have more or less of global governance. There isn't really a need, uh, to create a, a blanket quote unquote one world, uh, government. So could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, government government make law and legislation. They make, you know, they they as we're all familiar with our our government, our so called elected government. They legislate in our country and and create the laws by which which are what the rules that we are supposed to live by. Um, you know, within within the boundaries of of the nation state. And they have different perspectives. So the government, the US government, you know, has a clearly has a different perspective probably to the Russian government and the Chinese government. So if you were, if you were going to create a system of global government, you would have to have quite close alignment and agreement between all these different nations. So all these different national governments would need to be on the same page if you were going to have a global government. But governance works by creating a policy agendas rather than hard and fast legislation. So governance means that you can introduce ideas into policy discussion. So that means that you can disseminate the agenda into every nation on Earth simultaneously without, you know, stipulating hard and fast legislation or even necessarily the specific form of those policies, which again, but that has another advantage in that if you're trying to to pinpoint how policy is formed, it's like trying to nail jelly to a wall because because you know they can there, there is no kind of legal culpability there. There's no liability because organisations like, for example, the Club of Rome. You can't you can't accuse them of of legislating and making errors in, you know, hard and fast law and policy in that extent, because they're just the ideas people or that's how it's portrayed. But they've got the economic and financial and political might behind them to actually enforce those ideas upon national governments so it but it's it but it's it's done through um non-legislative means and that means that you can introduce an idea into many nations at once without having to um go down the path of government well aptly stated thank you so in in, in returning to sort of this um or, or, or in continuing sort of this this line of discussion you know when people have talked in and fear mongered and, and what have you, not necessarily wrong in their fear mongering, right? About, um, uh, the threat of global government or the one state or, or what have you. Um, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the United Nations specifically, right? Um, and I found, um, in your recent article, um, I'd never seen this before. I was quite taken aback by it. Um, it was a, a speech given by a former, uh, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, 
uh, who uh, spoke to the World Economic Forum in 1998. Um, and I, uh, well, of, of course, when he gave the speech, he was head of the UN, right? Um, yeah. Uh, and I just found it, um, <laughs> oh, wow, uh, really telling, uh, specifically because, you know, the UN relies so much on the perception of it as sort of this, this college of governments all coming to work together, the sort of League of Nations idea, um, and, you know, that they, that they essentially are working, uh, with only governments, right? And that it's all the governments are coming together to negotiate among themselves and, create global policy, but they're, you know, ostensibly elected governments all coming together to do that. So it sort of has this, uh, and I think that's a necessary illusion uh, for them to maintain in terms of, uh, you know, the public uh, actually listening and, and caring about uh, what they have to say and, uh, and, you know, among other things. For for people listening, I, I, I would like to read that quote, if that's okay. So um, in, in this speech that you quote, uh, Kofi Annan says, the United Nations has been transformed since we last met here in Davos. The organization has undergone a complete overhaul that I have described as a, quote, quiet revolution. A fundamental shift has occurred. The United Nations once dealt only with governments, but now we know that peace and prosperity cannot be achieved without partnerships involving governments, international organizations, the business community, and civil society. The business of the United Nations involves the businesses of the world, In quote. So, Ian, uh, what do you think uh, Mr. Inan is saying here? Well, he's, he's selling stakeholder capitalism. That, that, is, that, is, the, that is stakeholder capitalism. It, it, puts, it puts, you know, global corporate interests at the centre of, of policy creation. So, so the, the, I mean, the, the um, World Economic Forum, um, they have global, they, they, they created, I think it was in a two, 2010, they created global governance councils. So these global governance councils, the list is unreal, the number of, they have got global governance. They have a, so many, yes. Yeah, they've got global co- governance councils for everything, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you look hard enough, there's probably a global governance council for pet care. I mean, they, they, there is, there is, there is no part of our lives that they haven't got a global governance council for. And the, the express purpose of those global governance councils is to advise policymakers. So bearing in mind that Nobody has elected anyone. If we, I mean, we talk about the democratic model, and you know, not obviously, not every country in the world follows a democratic model in 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 the same way. But there is no democratic accountability with the World Economic Forum, for example. And the World Economic Forum are just one of the members of the global public private partnership. But 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 through these global governance councils. They are setting the policy agenda for all nations, and you know, and it is it is through organisations, uh, you know, and and through. I mean, everybody is probably f- perhaps familiar with the Davos get together, but of course that is just a moment, one moment in the year when they they all have a bit of a soiree, and I'm sure there are some some important discussions that go on behind closed doors, but. This is an this process. Davos is just a one day out of the year, but the 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 the, the process that it embodies that Davos embodies is every day of the year. Right. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. this. This is this is the the kind of discussions that are, that 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 are um, pushed at Davos or celebrated at Davos. They're happening all the time. Yeah, they absolutely are. Um, it, as an example, you know, I'm doing this, um, investigation, um, on, on Moderna right now. Uh, the first part as we're recording this is out. The second, uh, part should be out probably, uh, well, it will be out this week, but it may be, um, the day after, day before this, uh, particular podcast comes out. Um, remains to be seen. But anyway, um, Moderna is part of this, um, 
uh, global growth company community that's run by the World Economic Forum. So only chosen uh, corporations and startups are allowed to join. Um, and essentially the, 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 the main selling point of being named this by the World Economic Forum is that you're given access to a platform that the World Economic Forum hosts that allows your company to connect with uh, privileged uh, leaders in the private and public sectors and in finance. Um, so this is, you know, they have <laughs> literal like messaging platforms and communications platforms to facilitate um, this exact type of activity uh, 365 days a year. So if, like you say, it's not just uh, Davos week or they're uh, yeah, yeah. where they're visibly together. Um, but I think, you know, a lot of people that try and um, poo poo this sort of like a uh, Naomi Klein uh, did in the Pompeo Midiar uh, billionaire funded intercept uh, last year saying that, you know, concerns about uh, the great reset are a, I think she called it a, a conspiracy smoothie or something like that was, was essentially saying, well, they, they plan all this out in the open and they show their faces at Davos. They're not really, you know, doing all this stuff behind the scenes. Well, I mean, how, yes, they are, <laughs> you know, like maybe they're not, um, doing it necessarily when they, when they are public about it and they do their public panels and have their public meetings at, at the, the World Economic Forum annual meeting that, that week in Davos, Switzerland, the Davos event. Um, but they have these, these private platforms where they're, uh, facilitating these, these partnerships all day long. And it's not just the World Economic Forum that does that either. No, I mean, I mean, I think, I think if you look at sort of any kind of policy consultation document, anything that comes out from, I mean, obviously I'm based in the UK, so I tend to look at the, the, the British ones, but you know, the US, US, France, Germany, wherever you look, if you look at a policy consultation document, just look at the contributors, just look at the list of contributors and follow those names and, and you will see the same organizations cropping up time and time and time again. So, you know, it's it's to, to say that, you know, that this is um, I mean, one of the things I suppose that Klein might have been right about in terms of saying, you know, that they, that why would they expose themselves to this? And people like Klaus Schwab uh, and people like, you know, Bill Gates and people like that, they have got a huge propaganda and and media machine. Um, public relations operation around them, and they are able to to come across as as selling nothing but goodwill to all men and women. That that is they they're able to present that public face. I mean, uh, you know, you could go back to the old, you know, the the, the way that, that Edward Bernays, for example, changed, and and people like Ivy Ledbetter Lee and people like that changed. The fortunes of the Rockefellers, you know, from a despised, despised family to, you know, to these sort of the sort of kindly old man that's going around giving out dimes. And so this kind this kind of operation enables them to stand in the glare of in the public public glare and and seem like that they've got nothing but the best of intentions. But of course, if in order to understand it's easy, you know, talk is cheap. So in order to to understand what their real intentions are, you need to look at the impact of their policies. And when you look at the impact of the policies, it's horrendous. Yeah, <laughs> it's 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 you know, you, you think, how can this come from a, a from a place of goodwill? It can't. Yeah, I think actually what you uh, uh, that brings up a really good point. And I think it was unfortunately very absent uh, when talking about people like Bill Gates, for example, in the past year and a half, specifically last year, uh, where he came under a lot of, I guess, um, scrutiny, uh, perhaps. So he was also much more in the public eye than he normally is. Uh, but before, you know, he was sort of treated as this public health expert in the in the COVID era, you know, he was a, a major evangelist for the so-called Green Revolution, um, which was essentially a, a lobbying operation for Monsanto um, and genetically modified foods um, and, and all of that um, on, on the uh, developing world. And, um, you know, if you're familiar with the uh, spike in uh, farmer suicides in India, 
or, um, you know, a number yeah. of related <laughs> issues, you know, that is essentially the, the consequences of his so-called philanthropy and, and goodwill, you know, originally sold by Bill Gates and, and others. Um, as though it was going to increase yields and, uh, you know, end hunger. It's, it hasn't done that at all. Instead, it's, um, you know, uh, it didn't actually, it, it didn't provably increase yields at all. Um, but what it did do is, you know, basically, uh, trap, uh, lots of, uh, small family farms and, and, and small scale farmers in debt traps leading to, in India specifically, um, a huge spike in suicides among other problems like environmental contamination and, and what have you. And really, uh, looking at, you know, his, his role as quote unquote philanthropist there, uh, you know, as a precedent to his, quote unquote, philanthropy, um, in the COVID era, I think was unfortunately, um, absent. Um, but, uh, yeah. you bring up a really good point with, uh, this, this whole philanthropist thing, cause this has sort of been, um, a, a theme that comes up in, in my work more often than not specifically with things like the, um, uh, my work on, on the Jeffrey Epstein case, because of course, before he was, um, arrested the first time around 2007 or so, um, you know, he was, uh, treated in the press as a philanthropist, Epstein himself, and he was actually very much involved, um, with this new shift in philanthropy that took place in the early 2000s. Um, and Epstein himself was intimately involved, uh, in, in this to considerable degrees because some of the, the most, um, I, I guess, important, uh, institute, philanthropic institutions to come out of that shift. Uh, were the Clinton Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Of course, we know that Epstein was um, considerably involved with the philanthropy of both the Clintons and uh, and the Gateses. Um, but also I would put, you know, like the Michael Milken, the uh, junk bond king and uh, financial criminal felon crazy man, uh, who uh, uh, the Milken Institute is his um, ph philanthropic endeavor, and of course, he's now treated as a philanthropist, despite, um, you know, having been one of Wall Street's most notorious criminals previously. Um, you know, it, it really has been, uh, since the time of Rockefeller, as you mentioned, in the early 20th century, um, a major way that people are able to, uh, launder their reputations, um, and so they can still, so, you know, they can engage in this type of activity, but then come out um, you know, on the TV and, you know, are essentially treated be through these public relations, um, institutions, uh, with the help of, of these public relations institutions are treated as, you know, um, our great benefactors, um, in a sense, you know, it's really bizarre. So, um, I mean, what I think, I think it's quite remarkable that, that, that there are those that don't appear to need to do that. I mean, people like Christine Lagarde. You know that that can go from head of the IMF to the ECB and just just and have having been, um, you know, convicted for essentially, you know, uh, for financial misconduct, and and people just kind of don't question that. 